Welcome to episode four of the Effort Report. I'm Elizabeth Matsui, and I'm here with Roger. Hello. And we are going to talk about money. Yes. And um, how we're paid and sources of money. But before we dive in, let's talk about um, a a follow-up point, which was that we had someone um, tweet that um, they were excited about the Effort Report podcast because there were only a few episodes, so it wouldn't take them long to catch up. But I think it's important to point out that um, you can listen to the podcast really in any order or listen to some and not all, and I think you won't really be missing out on too much. <laughs> well, <laughs> but you should definitely listen to all the episodes. <laughs> well, yes. Because <laughs> they're but, all valuable. Yes. But. But, but I know that sense, right? Like of, <laughs> of, you know, do I have time to listen to this or, or what have you? But if you're a commuter... By all means, listen to all of them. While you're <laughs> As you were saying that, I, I realized that we were telling people not to bother with, with listening to the other episodes. To the other, only yeah. listen to this yes. episode. But if you are coming in onto this episode for the first time, don't worry, you haven't missed. Yes. You know, the you can listen to them out of order. Yes. It's okay. All right. So um, we were going to talk about why we named our podcast the Effort That's Report. That's right. Yes. So what's what is an effort? What is your understanding well, I, of what well, an effort? Well, this is a question. Actually, I'm not sure if this is. If they call it this at other institutions, I, I haven't bothered to check. Uh, but we have to do something uh, at Hopkins for grant-supported activities, uh, which is called effort reporting. Which... And I think I think this is a federal government term. No? Oh, is it? Is, think... It might be. Yeah, I, I can't remember. It was so long ago when they started this that I couldn't remember if that was like what Hopkins called it or what the government called right. it. But anyway, I'm guessing that everyone has to do. Uh, it's called the same thing everywhere. But we have to basically, essentially, allocate our time to vary all the different grants that we're on in terms of what percentage of time is spent on those grants, do, working on the subject matter of that grant. And we have to do it every six months. And um, it is basically a way of the, of the uni- so basically you have to kind of take ownership of how you allocate your time. And it's a way of, <laughs> for the university to essentially say, that's your problem and you, ha- your meaning the investigator's problem, and that you have to kind of own this and so if it turns out that it, it was not correct, that's kind of your problem. It's not the university. Right. And I think there, yeah. I don't remember the penalties specifically, but there's some significant penalties for effort reporting fraud. Yeah, right. That, yes. that are related to having, you know, federal government sources of funding Fun, right. for your projects. And, yeah. um, and which is why I think the, the penalties think we're pretty significant, which is why the university, right, I click on something that says I certify my effort report and right. I take ownership of, you know, the, the truth or the validity of right. it. And yeah, I think we all do that. Yeah. Right, right. And, um, and we're still here. Yeah, so far. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah and this, this started like after I got here, so it was not that long ago, I think. I remember I, did, I, remember I had to do the training and everything. It was new. I um, guess that's... It was like 2005. Five? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Anyway, so... That's where the name comes from. For I guess for people who do grant supported activities, they probably figured that out already. <laughs> right, right. So anyway. So tell. So what's on your effort report generally? <laughs> like, like how how is your time allocated? Well, the funny thing about the effort report, the way the system works is that like <laughs> it's it's a little scary because it's it kind of hard to it's kind of hard to tell. So the administ the administrative people are very helpful. They kind of figure out like you know they kind of pre fill it with what their percentages are on each grant. But it's hard to tell because each grant, like the title, there's no title for each grant. And it's just like the number of the grants. So I have to kind of figure out like which grant is is corresponding to what percentage. But anyway, they're like half your grants, right? So. <laughs> I own you. Yeah. No. Only, so, ha- only half of you. Yeah. So being at the School of Public Health here, uh, most of my effort reporting is NIH grants. Uh, I am on one NSF grant, which comes through the... Um, well, which came through the uh, uh, Department of Geography and Environmental Engineering on the on the Arts and Science campus, but almost all of it is NIH grants, and the percentage on NIH grants roughly adds up at any given time, kind of adds up to between seventy and eighty percent of my time, and then the other twenty to thirty percent um, is allocated to what's called general funds, uh, and um, that can be that just is covered by the department in a variety of ways, and we can maybe get to that later okay yeah so for me usually give or take i have about 80 percent effort and salary support from grants and they're almost all 
NIH or federal government grants. And then um, in the School of Medicine, the service that we do is clinical service. And so you do generate some revenues by seeing patients. And that those revenues pay for you know, roughly the percent of your salary that is equivalent to the time that you allocate to that activity. So I see patients about a half day a week, so that's roughly 10% time. So mm -hmm. about 10% of my salary support comes from clinical revenues within our group, our division. Mm -hmm. And so that leaves anywhere, sometimes I've been at 90% NIH funding, so that leaves anywhere from 0 to 10% that comes off of um, if foundation, it's actually, it's not a grant, it's um, kind of an endowed um, Utahwood Foundation mm -hmm. um, pot of money that came from the Utahwood Foundation and is actually split between, I think, four or five different divisions in the School of Medicine. Mm -hmm. And so that um, endowment money helps pay for kind of the difference between the clinical effort and the research effort that, that's not really covered by other sources. I mean, so right. you talk about general funds. Right. Or, yeah. So anyway, so, so if I could, so your your salary, roughly speaking, is broken down into government grants, mm -hmm. uh, NIH grants specifically. Uh, then there's clinical as uh, clinical services. Right. And then a small slice of kind of what you might call endowment right. funding. Uh, and is that about, is that right? That's about yeah. right. And for me, I guess it, it, there's NIH grants. Um, there, um, of which I sometimes I'm the principal investigator, but usually I'm not. Uh, I guess for you, you're always, almost always the principal investigator, right? Uh, yeah, I have some things so. that I'm the co-investigator yeah. on. Are and then, um, so for me, there's NIH grants. There's teaching. There's, so we get money through tuition in the School of Public Health, uh, and I teach. You know, I teach two classes uh, in the fall, and then uh, we do have uh, we do have endowment money in the in the Department of Biostat. Um, it doesn't come directly to me, like I don't have like an endowed chair or something like that, um, but it kind of comes indirectly to me in the sense that it goes to everybody uh, in the department. Uh, and then, um, and that's basically it. Those are the main, the, so, so those are the major sources of funding, I think, for someone in a biostat department, NIH grants, tuition, maybe some endowment. Uh, and then uh, occasionally uh, we may do some consulting through the department, in which case the school kind of um, splits the money uh, with what do you. you Oh, the school. Well, yeah, right. So yeah. there's a layer of kind of people call them taxes that go. Yeah, there's like yeah. a dean's tax. Yeah. So, so if if, I, if we go give a short course somewhere on whatever, to, for like a pharmaceutical company, um, the, the pharmaceutical company will pay the school and they will split all the money with. And right. That, some the, some of that might go to your salary. Right. Yeah. Right. And so by the time that it comes down to your department or your division, people have taken their cut. Off, there are right. multiple layers right. above that where yeah. they've taken their cut off yeah. of it. So um, I think, and I think uh, both. So both you and I have a very characteristic kind of medical institution salary breakdown, uh, which is you know seventy to eighty percent on grants, and then kind of uh, twenty to thirty or maybe forty percent on other what you might call hard money, uh, whereas the grant money is soft money. Right. Yeah. And so the other, you're, you're more familiar with, say, arts and science, sciences campuses or models or Homewood. So they have a different kind of, I mean, they're paid usually, they have a nine-month salary. Yeah. So I'm only, <laughs> I'm only familiar in, the, in as much as that I like, know people. Who, right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, I've never worked at, a, at an arts and science type of campus. So it seems attractive so. that you have your summers off, but, but you're getting not getting paid for yes. that time, so, right? So at most uh, arts and science type or engineering type campuses, they typically have nine or 10 months salary. Uh, so their salaries are quoted at a nine and 10 month rate. Um, so they, so at first they always look a lot lower, <laughs> but they're not. Um, and so in that, that their salary in that nine or 10 months is typically, you know, covered by tuition. So you teach more classes on those kinds of campuses. Uh, often they'll do three and two. So there'll be five classes total for the year. Um, and then, um, and then your summers are unaccounted for. So like summers being the two or three month period, uh, roughly, you know, to June, July, and August. Uh, and so those are not accounted for immediately by your salary. But however, most people uh, in the sciences uh, and engineering will can cover them either by being on a, by getting a grant uh, or being on someone's grant. 
Uh, and so, and so it's different. So, uh, or, uh, institu- uh, institutions like the NS- National Science Foundation, you know, you can only you can only allocate, I think, a maximum of like two or three months of salary uh, on your, if, even if you're the principal investigator. So, and that's because yeah. those that organization has kind of structured its funding opportunities to- such that there's an expectation that the university will cover the other nine. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but it's more akin to kind of. The arts and sciences yeah. undergraduate type of campus. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, uh, and I think um, so. So the, the it's a bit of a, f- I guess you could call it a flip in the sense that the, those campuses tend to be a vast majority on what you might call hard money, which is tuition, uh, and then a minority of their salary comes from soft money. Um, this is well, I should say this is typically for tenure track type investigators. There are kind of research faculty on both campuses that often will have a hundred percent of their salary coming from grants. And if you're in, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but if you're in a non-science department and the, on the undergrad campus, it, it, you write a book, mm-hmm. but you don't necessarily have a grant to write that book. I mean, so there's some if you're. I don't know, classics professor or sociologist. Do you do you do you have any idea how I, that's funded? I am or? not terribly familiar with how I, there are. They do get there are grants in those areas. I think there's mm-hmm. not like the kinds of huge government sources that we have as uh, can doing science, but there are kind of foundation and kind of gr- uh, fellowships types of grant type things where that may you, that you could apply for to say, write a book or to work okay. on a project or something. But I'm not, I, I'm, yeah, it'd be good if there were people out there to kind of write in to let us know right, how right. the funding works in that scenario. So how much, what, what are the, how much heterogeneity is there, do you think, in your department and then maybe in the School of Public Health in terms of, so you just outlined sort of this, you know, most of your funding comes from grants and then, a uh, minority of it comes from these general funds, which are include tuition. Is that similar across the board? Like, is there a written expectation that um, you, you know, need to cover 100% of your salary, and that means that if you only have 30% grant support, you're going to be doing a whole lot of teaching? Right. Or is there a, a different set of expectations? I, I would say different departments are just totally different on how they deal with this, it's even within the School of Public Health. So our department doesn't have, we don't have a written, it's not written down anywhere uh, what the percentages are that you're responsible for. That you're not aware of it being that, written no, down I mean, anywhere. No, no one has ever told me that there's a document with a percentage, with a right. number on it. Right. Um, but we openly talk about how, on average, the department, in order to be solvent, uh, has to have 70% of this, or maybe 75% of the salaries covered by grants. Um, so the department, is, it, it should be made clear that the department does not have enough money to pay everyone's salary uh, out of tuition. And is there, um, so, so that's an interesting model because it's not spoken about in terms of, on an, in individual terms. Right. I mean, you, it would, of course, the stat department would talk about things in terms of averages, right? <laughs> <laughs> But, but it's also like a different like political system. Because, yes. Right? Because yes. it means that... That means some people can be more and some people can yes. be less. And yes. everyone's happy with that or not so much? I, mean, I think it's one of these things that comes up once in a while in terms of how can we don't have a rule or maybe the rules should apply on an individual basis. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those kinds of debates, I think they, they ebb and flow depending on, I don't know, I think, depending, I think, on larger kind of circumstances. Right. Um, and then there is the issue of the salary cap. The NIH salary cap. Yes. Well, yeah. Maybe we'll get back to that. Okay, we'll yeah. get back to the salary. But uh, cap. That, that is an interesting point, actually. But um, yeah. So I think, but in our department, the general idea is that we should average out to about seventy-five mm-hmm. percent, or roughly speaking. And depending on the nature of the economy, that may go up or down. Um, a salary in terms of grants from a salary from grants, and then. Um, so you guys are not Ayn Rand yeah. supporters. <laughs> <laughs> well, who? who I don't know. <laughs> what this institution could be, yeah. Um, and, and, the, and so, and we all roughly, that's the other thing, we all roughly do the same amount of teaching, uh, which kind of justifies the roughly the same amount of kind of tuition support. Uh, and then, um, um, but other, I think other departments are very different. Um, but the fact of the matter is, um, other departments are different in the sense that, you know, if you're in the Department of Epidemiology, I mean, you fu- you basically cannot do your work unless you have a grant. Right. I mean, you cannot conduct an epidemiological study without a grant. But you can do um, biostatistics without a grant? Without having your own grant. 
as long yes. as you have data. Well, as long as you have other people who are willing to pay for your salary through their <laughs> grants, right? right? So, I mean, many of the grants around the institution need biostatistical support, and they, they in, in order to do that, they will cover part of your salary. So right. there are many biostatisticians, not necessarily here, but in many other institutions that have you know, most of their grant-supported uh, salary just on other people's grants, and they're not the PI of any particular grant. But in other departments, like whether it be international health or epidemiology or whatever it is, I mean, you can't do your work unless you have the PI on a grant. Right. And so um, so they tend to have a lot more grants just because that's the nature of their research. Uh, but I, I think in other departments that, you know, I think we do a lot more teaching uh, in, in terms of the volume of students that we teach. So uh, not the number of classes, but they're so, yeah. they're so like required by everybody. Yeah, basically every student in the school takes biostatistics in some way or form. So we, we effectively teach every student in the school. Um, that's not true of, of molecular biology or of even of epidemiology, although most students, I think, take epidemiology. So um, anyway, so the volume of teaching is quite a bit bigger, and so we have quite a bit more of our allocation coming from tuition. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually a that's contentious a, point in the school in terms of how much tuition, how the tuition money gets divided right, It should be divided by class or by student taught. Exactly, yeah. So rough, it's hard to say, I mean, because the formula for allocating tuition is rather complicated. But roughly speaking, you could say it's divided by, you know, how many students uh -huh. you teach. That's yes. good for your department. Yes. I mean, I've worked in other schools. For example, I think at UCLA, the, uh, the, it, was, it, was, it was allocated by kind of how many classes you taught. Mm -hmm. So that, obviously that is a very different model uh, in terms of how the tuition around the school is divided up. So, uh, so that's a so I, I wouldn't say understanding that is an important part of like being a professor, but it's kind of good to know, kind of keep track of in the back of your mind. I think. Well, I think pe people are not uh, told this. At least I yeah. know like um, the clinical fellows um, that are in the school of medicine. So this is generally not a part of common knowledge, yeah. and um, a lot of times with junior faculty, maybe they're starting to kind of hear about you know, how you're paid and what the expectations are. Yeah. So, uh, so um, yeah, so there, but there's a lot of heterogeneity. I think most of the other, like other departments, for example, who do more, that do more t research relative to teaching, I mean, they will often be 96, 97% on grants because there's really nothing else. They, they primarily do research. Right. Um, so how stressed are you about maintaining whatever, <laughs> 70% or... When we have people interview for jobs here, um, the first, the, usually the first thing they ask about is how do you deal with the fact that you have to cover seventy five percent of your salary mm -hmm. on grants, and um, and, and often and, you, and your answer isn't oh it's just that on average it's seventy five percent so just <laughs> don't worry just get twenty five percent and somebody else will uh, cover the rest yes. yeah um, yeah even statisticians that the argument doesn't play well no. um, but. Um, uh, often, because we have applicants come from kind of more traditional arts and sciences departments, and they don't hear about this ever, and then they come here, and it's like the first thing that they're worrying about. And I think um, it, uh, you know, I think the, that depends quite a bit on the nature of the institution. Around here, it's never been a big concern because our department is relatively small, uh, as for as biostat departments go, and there's a lot of research going on here in the institution, and. Almost everyone needs biostat support. Right, but you guys are, um, you know, it is the seller's market. Yes. For biostatisticians. He, at least here, here it is, yes. yes. And so we're lucky in that way. Um, other institutions is not necessarily the same situation. There's not as much research going on in mm -hmm. around the institution, especially with medical research. And so um, it's, the market is the market, so to speak, of effort is different. Um, and so, um, so here it's not so much, well, I, what I usually tell the applicants for job positions here is it's not so much, you know, can you find the dollars uh, to cover your salary, but it's more, can you find the people that you actually want to work with that who are, can cover, you know, that you, who you, whose grants you can participate on. That's right. That's the harder part. Right. Because yeah. in the end, if you're spending 70% of your time doing something you don't enjoy doing and right. working with people you don't enjoy working with. Right. It may not be worth it in the end. Yes, that would be a, yeah. at least a difficult situation. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, we got a little bit into, uh, there's one issue that I want to talk about, which is indirect cost, but we don't have to talk about that. We can get back to that if you want. Yeah, maybe should we talk about the School of Medicine? Yeah, so uh, yeah, what's it, I, I imagine there's even more heterogeneity. There's a it. lot of yeah. heterogeneity and a lot of the, um, so, so there are always these rumors that there's some sort of fixed amount of, salary support you should have coming in from grants and that that varies that you know whatever the 
spoken, unspoken rule or whatever is varies from one division or department to, to another department. And a lot of it depends on how much clinical revenue that they bring in. So just like in the School of Public Health, the hard money is tuition money. Over in the School of Medicine, the hard money is clinical revenues. And so we are sort of the culture and the forces or financial forces that affect kind of how we work and how we are paid are directly affected by what's going on in healthcare and, right. and healthcare dollars. And in the kind of the bigger picture. In healthcare. the bigger picture. Yeah. And it's directly affected by um, the kind of medicine that you practice. So certain subspecialists you make a lot of money because the way that our, our kind of healthcare payment model works is fee for service and procedures are much more highly um, paid for than um, a visit with, you know, a pediatrician or an internist who's just thinking about your shortness of breath and mm -hmm. how to evaluate it. So um, which, which uh, specialty is the biostatistics of medicine in terms of the hard money allocation? Oh, the hard money allocation? <laughs> you guys might be up there with, you know, ophthalmologists really? or like a <laughs> okay. surgical subspecialist, okay. maybe, you know. <laughs> I think you've cornered the market <laughs> <Yeah>. somehow, <laughs> right? Because it's a seller's market for mm -hmm. you guys, and you have your your paid per student. Yeah, roughly speaking, so, I realize right. it's not exactly that. Anyway, so, so, so there's so, very different. So, so there's huge, di you know, differences in terms of the amount of clinical revenue that comes in, and if you are in a specialty where there's a lot of clinical revenue, then people are. You know, because resources are ample, there's much less tension over how much grant support that you have because mm -hmm. there's more money to go fill in the gap between the clinical time that you do and, you know, the amount of research effort that's, that's covered through grants. Whereas if you are in another division or department, so in our field, even though allergists actually are very well compensated kind of out in the private practice setting, they, we are not so much here in this setting for a variety of complicated reasons. Um, so we don't really, you know, bring in clinical revenue. If I work 10% of my time in clinic, then roughly I'm covering that proportion of my 10% of my salary. Mm -hmm. um, so you break even. So I break even. Yeah. So there's no, no way, you know, so what's happening in the other specialties is they work 10% of their time and they're bringing in the equivalent of 20 or 30% of their salary. And so you can see how they're in a completely different situation than we are over in pediatric allergy and immunology. Right. Um, so I think that has affected things. And what's happened over time, just as one example, the profit margin of hospitals has shrunk considerably over the last 10 to 15 years. And that's just one example about pay, you know, how payment in healthcare has affected clinical dollars that go and support um, some of the you know activities of faculties and schools of medicine and right. so that's been a source of kind of financial pressure. Um, and, and are there percentages written down for for any department? I am not. About like how, I'm, I'm not aware of them. Yeah, I, I imagine do, that's not something but I, you write down. No, but I do know that in the last this has all happened. There was a big kind of government funding crunch that happened maybe ten years ago, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And be, certain places, especially divisions or departments where they didn't have a you know lot of clinical revenue coming in, um, started to more proactively at faculty members' annual reviews talk about their funding and whether they were adequately funded or not. Right. And if they didn't, some of them would receive a, like a, a warning that if you don't get funding in a year, you're going to then get a terminal contract at right. that point in time. Yeah. And that was the first time that at least the people who'd been around longer than I had said that this was kind of a, a big change mm -hmm. in kind of the culture and how things operated financially. And I think that change was a manifestation of division chiefs and department chairs having to balance budgets in the face of shrinking clinical revenues, shrinking government dollars, and lots of faculty who had, you know, a gap between their percent effort on research and their clinical percent effort and needing to fill that gap. Yeah. Um, so that, and there were people who left yeah. because of that yeah. in, in all seriousness. But so it was. So I, that raises the question in general, kind of what happens 
if you if your salary is not covered uh, by any by you know if you, if you if you know by either by grants or whatever it right. is suppose you come up short um, so you could argue for example in our department you know the department guarantees let's say twenty five percent of your salary and do the, but that's um, not really written down anywhere that's not really written down right but if the expectation is you know, you have to get the other 75. Right. So what if you only end up with 70? Right. Or 65 right. or whatever it is. Um, and so, and I think, th- so that varies dramatically also from department to department also. I think, he, you know, here for the most part, if you come up short one year, you know, there are, there are kind of, there's a cushion, a little bit of a cushion. Well, say, because there are also other people who may be. Yeah. So a, a, it may not be a problem, but if the department as a whole were to come up short. Right. Then it would be a problem, but not an emergency. I think um, because there are some there is money that's you know quote saved, um, but not forever obviously. Right. And I think um, and and we should actually talk about the saved money after yeah. you finish this. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I think um, yeah. So I think but of ultimately if if the department as a whole is coming at least if our department as a whole is coming up short in terms of external funding, then it becomes a depart a problem for the department and um, something has to be done. And what exactly would get done is not entirely clear. But in other departments, you know, where they, it's more, I think, it, you know, they tend to look at this more at an individual level. Um, I know that, you know, you, the, after a year, there's going to be a discussion about, you know, you know where can you, can you get your funding from? And if the problem continues, um, ultimately, I think, um, you know, salaries would have to be cut um, because it can't, the, the other, the, there's only so much of a cushion to kind of fall back on. Right. Yeah. So that cushion... Um, one thing that was interesting to me that I learned is that it, there is this sort of process of when there's a new leader who's mm-hmm. brought in, right. they negotiate a package right. to take the job. And the package that they negotiate is the amount of resources that they need to do what they would like to do. And it's sort of a vision that whoever's hiring them, the department chair or the dean, agrees is a good vision And they say, well, I need this much money in order to, I don't know, hire ex faculty who's going to have served this role and that sort of thing. So they also think about when you're in a position of negotiating that kind of job, how long you think you're going to be in that job. And sometimes what happens is, is people get those startup packages, they take on a leadership role, they spend down the money, and then they go and get another job and renegotiate (laughs) another package. But So if you are in a place, in a division or department where there's been a new leader hired recently, right. there are often more resources that are available. Now, If they negotiated well. If they negotiated well. Now, that doesn't mean that the person who negotiated was thinking of you as an individual. Right. <laughs> but um, it does mean that, that there's at least something there that right. could be helpful, which is very different than... Um, and I've seen this happen in other sort of divisions and departments. Someone's been there 15 years, mm-hmm. and through through the federal government funding crunch, they lost a bunch of faculty, but they were then out of all of their startup package. And so they have no funds to try to rebuild, let alone try to help bridge people, you know, between grants. Right. And yeah. that, to me, was a big surprise yeah. that that phenomenon existed. I don't, does it happen kind of in the public health arena, too? Sure. I think there, definitely if a new chair were to come in or a new division head were to come in, that gets negotiated. And there's a chair's discretionary account um, uh, from which money can be drawn. Um, the department as a whole could also have some... And did you negotiate getting a checkbook to that account when you were hired? <laughs> no, that's not, that's not one of the options <laughs> no. on the menu. Darn. <laughs> A direct check writing right, privileges. No, just a debit card. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, but I, <laughs> actually, I hadn't thought about that. Maybe I should bring that up in, in my next annual yeah, meeting. Yeah, let, let me know how that goes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean, there's also, I mean, sometimes if the department runs a surplus in a year, you know, that money can be banked and uh, or it can be put into the endowment or something like that. And so there, off, there sometimes is, you know, um, reserve, I guess is what you would call it. Uh, and the school as a whole has a reserve, and uh, and, uh, and the departments individually can have reserves, um, and so that can be used to kind of offset uh, either shortfalls or things like the NIH salary cap, um, which we should talk about. Yes, so the NIH right. salary cap is—I is, think it's currently one hundred eighty-five thousand um, dollars. It just so got—it just went up. 
I think it's a higher than oh, that. Oh, is it higher than that? I think. Okay. But I mean, it's roughly in that it's, box. In the it's neighborhood. Less, yeah, it's yeah. in that neighborhood. So the NIH is, my understanding is the NIH is unwilling to cover any salary that's higher than that. Right. So if someone makes $200,000 a year, right. which in the medical world, among senior people, is is not, not really un- that unusual, particularly when you get into like subspecialties. And so, so, P, so not only, we talked about how there's more clinical revenue going into certain uh, divisions or departments that have highly p- paid clinical services that they provide, but their salaries are often higher Just generally too. Higher, yeah. um, so if someone makes two hundred thousand dollars and they're going to devote ten percent effort to something, NIH is not going to, or federal government's not going to cover ten percent of two hundred thousand dollars. They will right. only cover ten percent of the hundred and eighty whatever thousand dollars. So that then puts kind of the burden back on the university for the difference between the salary cap and that person's, that yeah. faculty member's salary. Yeah, so it can become a problem if you have a lot of senior faculty covered on grants. Because the, <laughs> because the fact of the matter is every grant they go on, you, you kind of lose money. Uh, because you're gonna, so for every dollar, if you have someone who has $200,000 salary and they're 100% covered on grants, then your department is out you know, fifteen whatever thousand right. dollars, um, and so um, in some sense, you'd rather have them covered by another mechanism um, that could just cover the whole thing. Right. And so it's. Uh, it, I, I mean, I think depending on the composition of your department and you know who's on grants, it can be an issue that needs to be dealt with. No problem. And, and what about? So what are some of the more other kind of? So we've talked about general funds. Right. How. When someone takes over a leadership position, hopefully they negotiate a good startup package with resources. <clears throat> there's grant funding. There's funding that comes from service, which can be teaching, or if you're a physician scientist, it can be clinical work. But there, there are other sort of sources of funding too. Well, actually, and, there's one. The one I wanted to mention was IDC. Oh yes, yeah. talk about, so, so we have to talk about indirect costs, which is yes. very shocking to people yeah. <laughs> when they hear this. Well, this is a bit of like a gray area, I think, in academia. I find that many people. What do you mean gray? I found that many people have very different understandings of what indirect cost money is. So, what's your understanding? So, anyway, so so for every grant that you get, you know, there's, you usually budget for the direct costs, which is like I'm going to pay for this pencil, or I'm going to pay for this test, or whatever. I'm going to pay my salary, etc. Uh, and that might be, let's say, five hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, and then Hopkins will tack on. I think it's sixty-two percent. I think of that now. Yeah, it, or, sixty-four, sixty-two, something like that. So in the neighborhood so, of sixty-two. So to Hopkins 64. like renegotiates with NIH. I don't know at what interval what the indirect is. So right. basically, someone from Hopkins says, so "This you, is why our overhead is this much." Right. So I mean, but just to finish that thought, yeah. if you put in a grant for a hundred, if you need a hundred dollars to do your research. Hopkins will the total grant will be one hundred and sixty four dollars uh, for for the so the NIH will be paying one hundred roughly sixty four. So you get a hundred of the hundred. So, so you get the hundred to do your research, and Hopkins gets the sixty four right. to pay the bills. Essentially, I call it you know like electricity and water and whatever it may be and and institutional Hop- review board like it's, some yeah, some yes. of the like infrastructure anything that's research related right yes. And, uh, and Hopkins, my understanding is Hopkins goes to the government every so often and basically brings all their bills and says, here's how much it costs to do research at our institution. And that's, this is why you need to pay us. And I'm sure it's a contentious negotiation and Hop- the government probably wants to pay less. And, and so and, and they somehow arrive at a percentage. And every university, every institution, I should say, has a different percentage. Um, and so some might be as low as 30 percent. Some might be as high as 200 percent. So um, you know what of some as high as two hundred percent? Yeah. So like the uh, some of these, uh, you know, like the applied physics laboratory is a very high. Oh really? Yeah, because they have like missiles and whatever that they're building over there. <laughs> so yeah, when so. you when you build <laughs> missiles, <there's>, yeah. They, <laughs> well, because you, you need to pay for a lot of security. There's and, a lot, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing over there. Yeah, it's all classified, but um, but yeah. So it's it, it and but that makes it in some way it can it can make it your your kind of indirect cost rate can make it difficult to apply for grants sometimes if there's a if there's a limit on the total budget. Oh Meaning right, right, direct right. So, and indirect cost. Right. Combined. So there are a couple of yes. different ways that um, organizations will put out requests for applications or proposals. And sometimes they say you can go up to um, 
five hundred thousand dollars a year in total costs. So if you, which means it's direct cost plus indirect costs right. can't be more than five hundred thousand. So if you're at an institution that has a high indirect cost rate, right. you're left with less money to actually do research. Right. Other types of announcements will say you can, you know, have a budget up to five hundred thousand yeah. dollars in direct costs. Right. And then that funding agency is just willing to pay right. the additional whatever it is in indirect costs. Right. Um, so that has important implications. And the other thing that happens is that if a lot of times when you go to foundations, they basically have said, look, we're a foundation. We are giving people grants, but we're not paying any more than 8%, 15%, 20% in indirect costs above and beyond this. And the institutions are generally, they understand that that's an important source of salary support and support for research endeavors. So they well, live, so live with that. And that some fields can only be funded through foundations and, right. and nonprofits. Right. Um, but so I, I think I think most people have their understanding of what indirect costs is. That's like not controversial. I think that most people okay. understand that part. Okay. The question, I think the gray area tends to come in, in terms of where does that money go? And, oh, um, that, and that is a big gray area. Yeah. And it so varies, I think, from institution varies, yes. to institution. So I think, you know, well, I think the main thing that people seem to, I think people seem to misunderstand is that that money is just like, it's just cash. <laughs> I mean, it's just in the sense that there's that's just free money. Where's my debit card? Yes, yeah. <laughs> so that's just free money that the university can spend however it feels, and um, and and that there are no actual costs associated with the indirect cost money, and um, and I think um, and the problem and, and the fact of the matter is obviously the indirect cost money is there because there are costs. That's why it's an indirect cost, right? Right. Uh, and they do have to pay for things like electricity and you know and water and whatnot, and. Um, and so, of course, we can debate, you know, whether that's being done as efficiently as it could be. Right. But well, there I are actual that, costs. Right. I think there are things, for. right, that people quibble about. Like, are we supposed to be paying for our telephones? Or are we not supposed to be paying right. for our telephones? So I, I, I think there is sort of a gray zone in terms of, you know, what what is the intent of indirect costs? Yeah. Like, it'd be interesting to understand what NIH's intent is and how it really gets spent. I mean... That could get us into a lot of trouble to well, start sure digging the, into that can of worms. Guess, but, you mean like the government in general? I'm not sure the NIH. Uh, right, right, right. Yeah. The government in general. Yeah. What, what, what it is that they expect that yeah. you know indirect costs um, cover. Now, certainly, it's incredibly expensive to run institutional review boards that right. review all human subjects research. Right. <clears throat> the other thing that's uh, kind of interesting is that you know some fields just incur much greater indirect costs than other fields. So besides just building missiles? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're running a laboratory, uh, if, uh, if you if you your your research or whatever could just be more research in, uh, resource intensive. But, but, um, but in, terms that's... Of, in terms of like uh, capital, not not like human costs, but just in terms of if you're using more electricity than I'm using. Okay. Um, and uh, and so it's not it's, I think you're using more electricity. Why well, right? you using more? <laughs> Isn't, yeah, that, isn't I, that the definition of being the biostatistician? Well, I started turning team? my computer off over the weekend. Okay, so, good. Yeah. <laughs> but um, and so it's um anyway. So the, so the how to in terms of how indirect cost money gets allocated around the university is always a topic of contention. I think in pretty much any institution. Right. Um, but that is sometimes a source of that can be an element of the of a department's budget, uh, because at least here in public health some fraction of the indirect cost money is distributed to the departments. Right. I don't know how far down the the ladder it goes, but I, our division does not get see any of the indirect costs. Yeah. So I, and I'm not sure that the department sees any of the indirect costs. Yeah. I actually don't know that for sure. Yeah. But that and and this kind of stuff is so the reason it's important to know that yeah. is because so we're talking about this and I think there's a bigger picture here, which is that you're trying to pursue something you're interested in and that you enjoy doing. And we're, you know, we're talking about the bottom line. Yeah. And we're in the weeds, right? We're now. in the weeds. But yeah. the bottom line mat- matters, and even understanding where those indirect costs go, because that is your kind of power and influence and leverage to do what you want to do, in essence. How, how so? How so? So um, if you have like a a track record of being very well funded and doing exciting work and you hit a dip in funding, your 
supervisor, chair, whatever, is going to be much more likely to dip into the, that general fund or whatever to bridge you over. Mm-hmm. Or um, if you have a great idea but you need seed money in order to do a little bit of pilot work and there's not really a good funding mechanism for it, you are in a much more influential position to, to try to negotiate that. You're also in a much more influential position to negotiate in the school of medicine the amount of time you're, you're spending doing clinical work. If right. you enjoy doing clinical work, by all means, do it. But it allows you to be able to say, you know, I'm, I'm not actually interested in doing that. Mm-hmm. And you don't even need to say anything else. Your boss is very aware of the dollar signs that are attached to you. Right, yeah. Um, and, and so ultimately the reason the bottom line really matters and understanding why it matters is so important is because it's, it's your ticket kind of to academic freedom. Well, it's and, kind of customizing your lifestyle, it's right. your academic lifestyle. And I think... Um, it's hard because understanding kind of where the money comes from allows you to think about, well, you know, how can I pay for whatever it is that I want, ultimately want to do in the end, whether it's teaching all the time or research all the time or some mix of teaching and research and, you know, stuff like that. And I think it's hard to to balance, you know, um, understanding all these things and worrying about all these right, things. Right, right, right. You know? <laughs> so you never told me whether you were stressed or not about that. You, I, you dodged that question. Oh, about, I, about, the, was, about what? About the... Whether you were stressed about maintaining a certain percent effort. You, you, that was an artful dodge. Uh, I, oh, I thought I answered it. Okay. Well, what, what you uh, said is, well, I have people come ask me that question. Uh-huh. Oh, that's and, true. Yeah. Okay. Did. You didn't actually say whether yeah. you've ever been stressed stressed yeah i have not been stressed in the uh you know the 12 or 11 years that i've been on the faculty here um about kind of where the money was going to come from for at least for my for the salary support um i've been th- that said i've been pretty lucky uh to kind of have collaborators or to be able to get grants on you know in my area so it hasn't been too bad for me um so i mean i think it's it's nice to be. It's it's helpful to be at an institution where there's a lot of stuff going on, right? Um, and I think that's actually an important point: is that being at an institution that has some name recognition can be important in terms of getting funding because there are things that are assumed about. Oh, well, you clearly there's the environment and the resources or whatever that you need, so it's easier for people to get grants, and then there are more people who are funded and more. Pe- people who are likely to be doing something that's similar to what you're doing in terms of collaborators. Yeah. So, exactly. so there's a little bit of a synergistic effect, all yes. of these. Yeah. Um, so I think it's it's not something that you could ever be just forget about. <laughs> uh, at least, like, you know, for example, I don't know if you guys do this uh, in medicine, but, you know, when we go out for a promotion to full professor, um, they have to kind of map out your funding for the next 10 years. Oh, no, they don't have to do that for us. But <laughs> if they catch wind of it. <laughs> That's because medical schools just can't even look out that far. No, right? no, They're just no. barely looking past the next e- year, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so they uh, they have to, uh, you know, the chair of the department has to map out your funding for the next 10 years. Obviously, you don't have a grant lined up for 10 years from now, but um, but at least they want to make sure that there isn't a pattern of like, oh, this person's going to be zero percent funded, in, and oh, and potentially over the NIH salary cap. <laughs> yeah, and over the NIH salary. Right, right, right yeah. So, um, but anyway, that was kind of an interesting exercise <laughs> for me. <laughs> that sounds like it. That uh, I'm I'm starting to sweat here just thinking about uh, mapping out my own ten year right. funding plan. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to go there. I have been. Have you? I've been stressed more about. Um, so because a lot of what I do is the data collection end of things. Right. I have a team that's mm-hmm. been anywhere from like 12 to 15 people, right. not including like trainees, because in those 12 to 15 people are salaried staff. Mm-hmm. And that's really hard being responsible for someone's livelihood. Right. And, and so I think that is, and, and I thought a lot about, okay, what's the optimal team size and right. you know how, how much can I really support and sustain and, and, you know, most people understand very much that they they are on soft money when they take these sorts of jobs. But at the same time, 
um, I do feel a certain responsibility that I'm not going to hire someone that I don't think I'm going to be able to support, you know, a year from the time right. that I hire yeah. them. I think I would imagine most people feel that way. Right. And I, it's always kind of interesting when, you know, every once in a while you'll, you'll hear about, oh, so-and-so is retiring um, from, what, you know, from, and so their, their whole operation is getting shut down. And so everyone who worked there has to kind of find a new job. And they might have been working with that principal investigator for 20, 30 years. Right. And then now everyone has to kind of like go find something else. And uh, I guess maybe 20, 30 years is uh, the most you can ask for uh, given at a, in one person's lab or operation. Right, right. Uh, but it does happen eventually. So I wanted to ask the other sort of other source of funding that I wanted to talk about a little bit was philanthropy. And I don't mean yeah. foundation grants, but mm-hmm. is there focus? In terms of like individual donors. Individual yeah. donors. Is there focus? Is, have you seen the amount of focus on pursuing individual donors change in the school of public health since you've been here? Well, I, we, I and we here in Biostat have not seen a huge change in focus. I think, um, I, it, I don't know. I, I get the sense that the, it's difficult to pitch biostatistics to donors, um, it, 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 because it's it's difficult to tell like a compelling narrative <laughs> about like we're going to analyze data really well, um, and it's I think it's a little easier to tell a narrative that's like we're going to cure malaria or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, we you know we have two endowed professorships in our department. And what is an sort of I think it, it's helpful to hear what does that mean when yeah. someone has an endowed professorship. So here it means that you've donated a certain amount of money. I and think an endowed professorship is in the neighborhood of $3 million. Okay. Uh, I've heard $2 million, but two, Yeah, I think it kind of depends. Well, uh, and, then, and the idea behind it is there needs to be enough money that's endowed that the interest off of that, right, right the, the, the money that you make off of that investment is able to support kind of in perpetuity, a cer- certain chunk of someone's salary. Well, or, yeah, but that, that number is totally arbitrary. Right, right, I mean, right. right. Think, but yeah. that's that's the concept. Behind. Yeah, I mean, if you think about a three million dollar donation, you can you typically will spend about four uh, percent, and then it might grow two percent. You know, and so four percent of three million is like it's not it's going to cover anyone's salary. Um, so, but um, but it covers it'll cover a chunk, let's say, right. and um, and I think an endowed chair is like five million. So. Um, we have two, and I think, uh, and they only came about in the last uh, ten years or so. Um, I, I know, like, I, I, I see, like, in like ophthalmology, I think like every professor is a doubt or something. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> so ophthalmology, Wilmer, which is the yeah. eye hospital or clinical entity, is actually s- separate from. Oh, I see. Hopkins from, Hospital from the, other, from the main hospital, and so they yeah. carve themselves out. I don't know what yeah. the, the how long ago, <laughs> and they're also a highly paid subspecialty. Yeah, which is why, like, I don't know whether you've ever been a patient or gotten your eye. Like, it's a it's a different experience. Yeah, culturally. I do go there for my ophthalmology. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. Anyway, but we're getting a little off track. <laughs> yeah. So, but Biosat in general, though, I think has not has seen some philanthropy over the years, and we have some very you know kind of generous donors. Um, but um, I think the, the 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 kind of attitude of the school towards for, is a little bit different for Biosat, I think. Um, and I think, um, but I, I think there has been one of the issues that a lot of the funding for international work has kind of gone away, and so we, there's been a need to kind of find other people, other sources to fund that. And it's gone away. From like government funding. Government funding. Yeah, has, things like right. USAID and right. those kinds of you know, sources have gone away. So. Yeah, on the School of Medicine side of things, with that government kind of research support funding crunch that happened around the time of the recession and all of that, there was a lot of talk about diversifying the financial portfolio and really right. working to build up philanthropy. And yeah. um, and I think that's happened. I personally have not seen it because, um, and I think this is the downside to philanthropy is that of course, the things that get the most money are not necessarily the things that affect the most people. Right. And they often are not the types of health conditions that affect low-income and minority populations right. because those are populations that um, don't have the deep pockets you know, to, right. to give money. Whereas in oncology, there are patients who come to be seen for their fourth opinion and they've you know, come – 
they've had the means and the education to kind of identify Hopkins as a place for X disease, and they've come, you know, from far away, and they oftentimes, not infrequently, will write a check, and that check may be for discretionary funds for that researcher, that investigator to use towards her research, mm-hmm. or it may be that they're interested in, you know, something on a larger scale. Right. But things like uh, inner city asthma, mm-hmm. which of course I, um, that's my research focus. There's not a, a whole lot of interest mm-hmm. in, in, or I think really ability to do substantial fundraising. And, and that there are other examples of other health conditions where that's the case too. Yeah, I think, um, I don't, I'm not sure what the, in terms of the of kind of seeking out philanthropy as a strategy uh, for like a, uh, another source of kind of funds. I'm not sure how, it seems like it's a very hit and miss type of it is. business. So, so I, I think, think, yeah, I think if you are a school of medicine faculty member mm-hmm. that it can't hurt to go, I don't know how things are structured here in the school of public health, but in the school of medicine, each department has um, a development office. Yeah. And it can't hurt to meet with them. Sure. Um, and they can certainly kind of help you think about uh, ways to, you know, pitch what you are working on. But I think the bottom line is that you're exactly right, that um, that is not a pl- – you, you can't kind of bank your research career right. on those philanthropy dollars. Yeah. Well, and the, so the other kind of potential diversification uh, source is, uh, is kind of technology transfer. And I, and I know, at least at Hopkins, they've been trying to develop that a lot more than they had in the past, and they hired a new person to kind of run the technology transfer office, and um, they've been trying to look for different ways. So Hopkins, historically, has always been just te- transferring medical technology, whether it's a blood test or like a device that you might develop. It's always been, in fact, the whole policy about technology transfer for the university is written assuming you're going to do something medical, uh, which is a little awkward if you don't. Um, that, that says something about um, the lens through which the university yeah. is viewed, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a commentary on the university as a whole. Um, but I think a lot of I think a lot of universities they want to produce the next Google or the next you know whatever. Uh, that's a, that's technology transfer as another source of kind of funds for doing other things. And, and, and how does that generate funds for the individual faculty member? So here, you know, I think every university is different. I'm sure every, every university is different. And here, you know, if you license technology, for example, if, if I patent something uh, and I want to license it to a company, say I want to license it to, you know, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft pays a license fee for that. That would probably occur on an, on an annual basis. And, and so um, every year that money that Microsoft is paying is going to the institution. It'll go to, it'll go to Johns Hopkins. And then Johns Hopkins takes that money and splits it into, um, there's a university segment there, which is, I think, uh, like 25%. These numbers are not going to add up, so <laughs> I'm award you to admit. And that's a biostatistician <laughs> yeah, talking. That's right. <laughs> so there's a university segment that's like 25%. There's a school segment, so like the School of Public Health would get a piece, which is like 15%. Your department gets a piece, which is, I think, another 15 um, Then your kind of discretionary account or your uh, whatever you might call it, your, dis- your kind of research account gets something like 10 or 15 and then you personally, meaning in your pocket, uh-huh. uh, get 35% of that fee. So it generates both like personal income revenue yes. as yes. well as research funding. research funding. Yes. And there is a difference between, um, so if you have um, accounts that are tied to some sort of government funding agency, those are not really discretionary funds. No, those are and, all allocated and budgeted. Right. Yes. And so your discretionary account, sometimes is also called a gift account, mm-hmm. is where you have funds, like you said, for like the tech transfer money. Sometimes if someone's giving money for you know philanthropic purposes, that money goes in there. And the nice thing about those dollars is that as they're called discretionary fund, they are less restricted in terms of what you can use it for. So if you need to support some pilot work that you want to do or you have a summer intern that you're thinking about hiring that you you know didn't really have NIH to support for, right. that can be very helpful. Yeah. So the other if, source of money often for these discretionary accounts is uh, your startup package. And your startup package, yeah. right. Yeah. Right. And so I'm in an awkward position of having – only NIH grant funds. I have a very small <laughs> gift account. 
<laughs> you need to license for technology. Apparently, yeah. yes. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. Is there anything else you want to talk about in this domain? I, I think that covers it. I can't think of anything else. Can you? Okay. That's no. the nuts and bolts of money in yeah. academia. We got super into the weeds of that, <laughs> more so than I thought we would. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so, I guess we'll see how it's received. Yeah. So maybe we'll end with the uh, where can people find you on the internet? At Eliza68. Okay, and I'm RD, at RD Peng on, uh, on Twitter. The podcast itself now has a Twitter account. Right. Which is at The, the e- Effort Report. So at The Effort Report, which you can, we will post updates to every once in a while. And we have an email account. Yes, so you can email us at The Effort Report at gmail.com. Yes, and so if you have questions or things that you'd like us to talk about, you know, feel free to send us an email or send us a tweet. Thanks. Uh,